inside this episode. We know a lot about what's offshore, and we have a lot of information about what's onshore, but this tight gradient here is just something that we don't know as much about. Auto arming. Our target number is 50 UAVs in live fly experimentation. And the goal of this test is to check whether we can control the spin rate of the system. Anti-submarine warfare, mine warfare and countermeasures, naval special warfare, amphibious operations, ship transit planning. The common link between these combat disciplines is the need for accurate, timely, and critical oceanographic data based on the latest advancements in technology, techniques, and science. And the Naval Postgraduate School is here to provide the foundation for such knowledge. This is Navy Beach, a hot spot for oceanography students to complete research projects while in MPS. To my right is Monterey Bay, MPS's large outdoor lab, so to speak. This area above water at low tide and underwater at high tide is called the intertidal zone and has become the focus of attention lately. Setting up the data gathering technology in this space is not easy, as we have seen in this video from last fall. Oceanography students work quickly to submerge seven sensors at intervals from the berm through the surf zone to the breakers. The sensors measure the thermal heating and cooling of the sand over the vertical as a function of tidal level and solar radiation. Placing the sensors on shore is much easier than at sea. They must fight the waves to put the rods in place, and one student must go underwater to make sure the sensor is positioned properly. In more recent months, Lieutenant Commander Darren Keeter has been performing a similar study at Navy Beach. Keeter has been monitoring this weather station, which has been measuring the natural forces affecting nearshore conditions. What I'm doing out here is a study of the microclimate of what's known as the intertidal zone. So it's the area extending from just offshore, just outside the surf zone, up to the dunes here in the back of the beach. And what we're doing is looking at how the influence of the tidal cycle, which you know migrates throughout the day when you have high and low tide, and the solar cycle, which is fairly constant, act together to create really strong gradients in temperature and humidity and other parameters right here in the uh, near shore area a place that hasn't been as well studied just because of the very dynamic nature of it. This tower was custom built here at Naval Postgraduate School. Most of the stuff comes from Campbell Scientific. Part of one of the learning things for me was figuring out how to build the system, run the wiring and cabling, how to program the system, and then get it deployed. We've had it in a few variances, and we're measuring quite a few things. Uh, High-speed, three-dimensional wind velocity and sonic temperature. Uh, using what are known as sonic anemometers and those are the ones that look sort of like egg beaters and those are measuring at 20 times a second. We also have a water vapor sensor that's measuring changes in the water content of the atmosphere. Then we have a few other sensors such as just our normal temperature and humidity sensors uh, which are the little white cones that are on the side of the tower. The little pine cone shaped thing is to protect it from direct solar radiation so the sun doesn't cause the temperature sensor to get too hot. And then what looks like the Starship Enterprise over here is a sensor that's measuring the downwelling shortwave radiation from the sun, the reflected radiation from the sun off the ground, as well as the terrestrial longwave radiation, either from the earth or from the clouds. For our long-term measurements of temperature and humidity over this environment, we're using these temperature and humidity sensors that were built by a company called Onset. Originally, we put them at two meters and four meters above the sand level. The sand level has been changing constantly. We've had up to a meter of sand added and up to a meter of sand go away within a week's time frame. These are taking measurements every 15 minutes and they're doing it and logging it as a self-contained unit here. We're also looking at the temperature in the water near the surface as well as the pressure so that we know what the water level is. So hopefully this research, uh, which was funded by the Office of Naval Research, ONR, and there's some follow-on projects that will be coming afterwards, will help us get a better basic understanding of these scientific questions and allow us to move forward with better forecasting techniques. After gathering enough data, Keter collects the sensors and returns to the Oceanography Center to compile the results. Over the next couple of days is download the data from these, the temperature sensors and the pressure sensors. Fairly simple to get to. Um, it's all self-contained. It's a little USB plug that hooks up to here. 
and download the data. Um, once you do that, then there's some processing that has to be done. The nice thing with the way systems are now is you can take it and carry it with you. You can do it at a coffee shop, you can do it at home, uh, you can do it between classes. Um, I'm starting to get to the point where some of the data that I need to crunch through, though, is a little more than I can do on the laptop. So I've got the uh, bigger hardware here just because I was literally crashing um, a MacBook Pro. The biggest thing I'm doing is converting a lot of data that came from the sensor, the big tripod that was out at the uh, beach. Those files are highly compressed, but when they're pulled apart, they're huge, and they contain literally uh, millions of observations in them. Estimated number of records in this one is 19 million, and it takes a long time for it to process. You know, you're recording for you know a week at a time at 20 times per second at six readings per instrument that's doing that. And that's just a lot of data. A lot of the work uh, is done with MATLAB. Uh, primary thing that we uh, use around here for doing our analysis. Again, it's just a way to parse through a lot of the data, do some of the uh, display and analysis, and be able to start just interrogating and thinking about how the data is done. The arduous process of analysis doesn't deter Keter. He sees the value in such research and effort. Potential uses of this research and data are everything from uh, wind stress and how the wind stress dynamics change uh, due to the constituents of the atmosphere. So how much energy the atmosphere and the wind imparts on the ocean, you know, so how that would affect nearshore currents and waves. Um, could have the effect on the atmospherics, um, electromagnetic, electro-optic uh, propagation. So especially in the nearshore environment where we're concerned with things like communications over the beach, whether you're in a um, humanitarian assistance disaster relief situation where you have one of our big hospital ships just off shore and you've got mobile hospital facilities on shore and you're trying to communicate back and forth between them and finding the optimum way to communicate and that communications path are seriously disrupted by rapid changes in temperature and humidity and other things in the atmosphere and those kinds of things affect uh, higher frequencies as well such as computer technology short path network for high bandwidth also affects radar or onshore by units that are onshore looking out to sea or by units that are on you know out to sea looking onto shore also of potential interest is you know how it changes the dynamics of everything else in the ocean as far as temperature goes in the near shore and whether or not those temperature variations can be linked to changes or interactions between the solar cycle which is you know fairly constant throughout the world you know barring clouds and the tidal cycle which isn't phased up with it and we know how much energy the ocean can absorb from the sun. At certain times you have low tide and you have this wet sandy area that can absorb a lot of heat. We can measure significant heat transfer from the surface uh, down to over a meter uh, just through the uh, daily changes and the phasing between the sun and the tidal cycle. So looking at those interactions and how that might affect things such as uh, transport of contaminants in the nearshore environment. You can go back to humanitarian assistance disaster relief Fukushima um, out in Japan, for instance, there was contaminants in the water, and we really just don't know that much about how they transport around. Again, we get back to the wind stress and the nearshore currents, you know, do temperature uh, variations on a small scale that can affect densities, allow some things to transport out a little further, lower, you know, as, as it's cooler down below, even down to something such as sand transport and sediment transport, you know, which then remixes contaminants in the water. And that's particular interest because as we have ships, again, off the coast, you know, we make our own fresh water. We use that water for cooling of our systems and our equipment. And if we're in an area where there's contaminants, we have to make sure we steer clear of those. Uh, that was a big concern in Fukushima and one of the main reasons we were trying to get that right and working with DITRA and other interested parties to figure out how to measure those things, sense those things, and forecast those things. So these are just some of the areas that hopefully this research will be able to uh, help us out. When we return, this small experiment has big implications. As some of you now know, research projects can be very time consuming and costly if funding is even available. So many students today often develop computer models 
and situations to test their ideas. However, for others, like Lieutenant Christopher Miriam, a hands-on approach, the small-scale version provides tangible evidence in support of a large-scale experiment. And about to drop. Three, two, one. My thesis work is essentially a stratified wake problem. We did some computer modeling and I'm scaling up from the virtual world into the real world using a tank. What I've done in this tank is layered cold water at the bottom with warmer water floated on top. And what I'm trying to do is look for uh, different perturbations in the wake that follow this little shuttle as it is pulled across the tank. So as it goes along this guide rod, it moves the water and causes uh, internal waves, which sometimes reach the surface. And you can see that with reflections in the infrared spectrum, thermal spectrum. I need to know the temperature of the water at different levels which is what I use this uh, temperature probe for. I've got measurements marked every five centimeters with the temperature being taken at the very tip. So I can suspend this at different levels within the tank, take a measurement and raise it up and, and create a temperature profile. The higher the velocity, the larger the weight. To control the velocity, I've rigged up a tow line I hang different amounts of weight from this hook and have it pull down. Heavier weight, faster speeds. To accurately measure the speed of the shuttle, I've attached a little foam ball to the line that passes through these photo gates, which are light gates. So there's a laser passing between each arm of the photo gates that when broken, starts the timer and stops the timer respectively. That time readout is seen on this oscilloscope by the drops in the two photo gates and the signal. So I can see how much time had elapsed. Since I know the distance between the two photo gates, I can measure the time and then calculate the distance traveled over time, which is velocity. So as I mentioned before, I am looking at the, the surface of the water using a infrared camera, which detects heat. By looking from a top-down view, I'm able to see when the cold wake breaks the surface of the water. And at that point, I can see a thermal signature on the IR camera where it's a little blue plume amongst the orange and, and yellow colors. I also have an actual temperature readout, of course, uh, for the more precise measurements. The next step, which we've already begun work on and designed some tow bodies, is to go out into Monterey Bay and look at real world uh, conditions, because those will vary quite a bit from tank work. There's exchanges between of uh, momentum, temperature, uh, sound, all sorts of environmental conditions are constantly changing within the entire spectrum of deep water at the surface and above the surface. In here, it's a very controlled environment, whereas out in the bay itself, I can't control what the, the stratification level of the water is, how cold the, the deep water is, how warm the surface is. Ultimately, Mother Nature decides what the conditions will be. The ocean also drives the atmosphere. The sea surface temperature has a huge impact on precipitation levels. Everyone is familiar with El Nino, where warm temperatures in the Western Pacific kind of slosh back to the Eastern Pacific. As we understand how that mechanism works, we're better able to tune atmospheric models as well as oceanographic models. So the more we know about this process, the better we can develop models that will predict the conditions of the ocean. After the break, MC3 Brian Abel brings us up to speed on the recent research experiments at Camp Roberts.
the Arsenal team recently achieved its ultimate goal in flying 50 unmanned aerial vehicles simultaneously. Let's watch. Congratulations to the Arsenal team on their success. McMillan Airfield. Payloads drop from a UAV. Small parachutes deployed to slow the descent. Systems engineering professor Oleg Yakominko has his students retrieve the payload, vary the rig, and repeat the drop. They do this again and again. And the goal of this test is to check whether we can control the spin rate of the system. If we can, then we can uh, basically follow the, the, the guidance paradigm we developed for Aegis and implement on this system. Yakominko is director of the Aerodynamic Decelerator Systems Center which supports the development of various weight, precision-guided airdrop systems. Delivering equipment and supplies by aerial payload is essential to battlefield operations, as it limits the need for ground vehicle convoys. However, aerial payload delivery systems are very expensive and must be retrieved to be reused. Yakomenko and his team intend to show that such costs can be reduced considerably, to about a quarter of the current estimate by using the less expensive cross-type canopies rather than the typical ram air parafoils. This experiment is supported by Natek Soldiers System Center and Cruiser, Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned Systems Education and Research. It is also in collaboration with Arctuis UAV and colleagues from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. That last drop we had a little bit of uh, an issue with, uh, looked like a line over for about half of the flight. So seeing if uh, if the line was still over or if it was hung up on uh, some of the exterior hardware on the outside of the box, uh, just trying to make sure that it was all, uh, that we couldn't figure out something right from there. My particular focus today has been a pack of shoots as I come down and go back up. A lot of tangles. <laughs> but when we get back to the lab, we'll be able to look at the data in a little more detail and uh, see what's happening. And eventually, what we're going to do is get the snowflake to drop autonomously and land on target where we want it to land. This is really a good opportunity for us to actually be a functioning testing engineer who has to build something. I have to drill, I have to screw, I have to solder wires and build circuits and figure out why things aren't working. And a lot of our program really doesn't get us involved in that, so we take a very academic perspective on engineering. And I think you at times forget how hard it can make it. No matter how rigid and scientific we make it, we always uncover a new failure mode or something that was a little bit unseen. U.S. Army Captain Simon Sanchez tests an alternative method of electronic communication to improve battlefield efficiency. 
Sanchez noticed the majority of radios used through the military have little to no spectrum sensing ability. He says this is problematic because a tactical unit may be asked to deploy to a location with an unknown and unknowable spectral environment. I was in a cavalry squadron, part of a, a larger brigade element, and we were tasked to move out. What often happened is that we moved outside of our communications infrastructure and oftentimes had to wait for retrans to be set up or some other element to come support us. And I thought as I came here, there must be some better way to do that. There's got to be a way that I can give the people that come behind me a way to have autonomous control of their communications infrastructure. Roger, stand by. Sanchez believes radios should be able to adapt to the environment, just as warfighters do. Enter white space spectral technology. It utilizes the frequency range left vacant by the analog to digital television conversion. That equipment's all been developed in a way that makes it adaptive to the spectrum environment, able to reach long distances. The server's on, so just uh, start your client. Sanchez says white space spectral technology provides a more efficient means to rapidly establish inter-theater communications and transfer large amounts of data vital to modern command and control. So if we can make a device out of that and create a relay that's uh, become the basis of the communications infrastructure, everything that all the communications are flowing over, both voice and data, then they can handle that infrastructure themselves. Moreover, signals can travel through microterrain and urban structures. And by its own nature, it will sense the spectrum environment, choose a frequency range to operate at, and join into a mesh network and allow them to expand as necessary. They can pick it up as they go back if they are able, or if it's not able to be picked up, it's just a relay. So there's no CI equipment on that equipment itself, so they can just leave it. White space spectral technology allows for scalable, mobile, and over the horizon networks. That it will give units moving around on a battlefield flexibility to adapt to the environment that they encounter as the military shifts from long deployments in places where uh, architecture has been set up over years to somewhere dynamic, like an uh, airborne operation conducted in a new place where the environment both on the ground and in the spectrum is unknown. Roger that. Additionally, 